Well, good afternoon, and uh, welcome, first of all, to the, uh, the Commons, which is a unique campus space for interdisciplinary activity. Welcome also to the keynote discussion, which is the final act of the afternoon-long event, Protecting the Vote. I'm Victor Bailey, director of the Hall Center for the Humanities. Today's event is uh, co-sponsored by a large number of campus units that are listed in your program, uh, for whose support we're extremely grateful. It's fair to say, however, that the event has been orchestrated by three individuals and by three units. The individuals are Sean Alexander, Associate Professor of African and African American Studies and Director of the Langston Hughes Center. Chuck Epp, Professor in the School of Public Affairs and Administration. And thirdly, Don Hader Markel, Professor and Chair of Political Science. The three units are the Langston Hughes Center, the Hall Center for the Humanities, and the Commons with their combined staffs. It's been a truly collaborative effort on the part of these individuals and units. The adoption of the landmark Voting Rights Act in 1965 had a transformative impact on American politics, enfranchising millions of Americans. It's widely regarded as the crowning achievement of the civil rights movement. When President Lyndon Johnson signed the act, he said many important things, but none more important than the vote is the most powerful instrument ever devised by man for breaking down injustice and destroying the terrible walls which imprison men because they're different from other men. Yet, 50 years later, we're faced with the invalidation of the pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act, thus allowing changes to be made to election procedures in states and jurisdictions with a prior history of voting discrimination. And, closer to home, we're faced with Kansas's 2011 law, requiring voters to show proof of US citizenship, to register to vote, and a photo ID at the polls. Clearly, we're still wrangling over the right to vote, the central pillar of our democracy. On the cusp of the 2016 election, it's surely appropriate to revisit this most vital political and civil rights issue. We're all grateful, I feel certain, that Kansas's Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, architect of the 2011 law, is willing to be part of today's discussion, and that Stephen McAllister, the E.S. and Tom Hampton Distinguished Professor of Law, agreed to start the discussion with him. It's not my role, however, to introduce these two people. For that task, I'll make way for Reggie Robinson, Director and Professor of the School of Public Affairs and Administration, who, among many other achievements, is former President and CEO of the Kansas Board of Regents. Uh, please welcome my dear friend and colleague, Reggie Robinson. Uh, thank you, Victor. Uh, I want to first uh, join Victor in welcoming you all here uh, this evening. Um, and I think Victor has provided a wonderful frame uh, for the conversation uh, that will take place tonight. Uh, as you've heard, uh, my role here uh, this evening uh, is to introduce uh, these ev this evening's uh, speakers, uh, and then I'll manage the question and answer uh, session uh, that will follow their presentation uh, during what we've styled as a discussion forum. Now, what that means by way of format is that once I introduce them, uh, these two guest speakers will engage in a bit of a conversation, an interview slash conversation, on a range of salient voting rights and election law uh, issues and topics for about 40 minutes or so. Uh, at the conclusion of that conversation, you'll see me make my way back to the podium, uh, and we'll open the floor uh, for questions from those who are gathered uh, tonight in the audience, and we'll try to work in a few questions that will come to us via social media platforms as well. 
Uh, so I look forward to the Q&A that will come later. And now to our guest speakers. Uh, leading the conversation, conducting the interview uh, tonight will be Professor Stephen McAllister. Uh, before he joined the KU Law faculty in 1993, uh, he served as a law clerk for not one, but two uh, justices on the United States Supreme Court, uh, Justice, Justice Byron White and Justice Clarence Thomas. Uh, he also served as a law clerk for Judge Richard Posner of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and he practiced law with the firm of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher in Washington, D.C. Uh, Steve is a distinguished graduate of the KU School of Law, and has been recognized at the university for the quality of his teaching and his service. Uh, he has also served as a dean of the KU School of Law and currently serves as Solicitor General for the state of Kansas. Uh, and in that capacity, he assists the state attorney general's office with constitutional litigation. And if I'm correct, Steve, you represented the state just yesterday in a case before the US Supreme Court. So welcome back from Washington. Yes, thanks. Uh, Professor McAllister's discussion partner uh, this evening is actually somebody in the context of these issues uh, likely needs no uh, introduction, and that's the Honorable Chris Kobach, uh, who has served as the Sunflower State's Secretary of State uh, since 2011. Uh, before his election to that post, uh, Secretary Kobach, who has earned degrees from Harvard University, Oxford University, and the Yale Law School, uh, served as a professor of constitutional law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He also served as a White House Fellow assigned to the office of then Attorney General John Ashcroft, where he played a key role focused on U.S. immigration and border control issues in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. In the intervening years, Secretary Kobach has, as we know, emerged as a prominent, and I would say albeit controversial, uh, voice on matters relating to both immigration law and policy and election law and policy. In the elections context, as you've heard from Victor, he has played a key role as Secretary of State and been a leading proponent for controversial voter registration and voter identification provisions and is the architect of the provision that is current law in the state of Kansas. As we mark this 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, its enactment, I think it's absolutely proper that we be gathered to consider and discuss these issues here this evening. I had the wonderful opportunity to hear from two powerful panels uh, this afternoon looking at a range of issues related to voting rights and election matters. Uh, the disenfranchisement of felons, uh, the emergence of the Shelby County decision that you heard Victor describe briefly, uh, the whole question of issues surrounding voter ID, the way that we're trying to strike this balance as we deal with these contentious issues between access to the very important ballot on the one hand with concerns that some have about the integrity of the voting uh, process. Uh, hopefully tonight will give us an opportunity to explore those issues in great depth uh, and with great uh, civility, and I know that we will do both of those things. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure uh, to turn the floor over uh, to Professor McAllister uh, to lead us in this discussion. Steve? All right. Thank you, Reggie. <laughs> so as Reggie indicated, the, the Secretary and I will engage in basically an interview, not a, not a, certainly not a debate, not a discussion. I'm not taking a position, but I'm going to ask him various questions to let him express views about things, and then you will have a chance to ask him questions uh, later in the program. We are going to try to cover the following territory, just so you know kind of where we'll be going. I will first get him to talk a little bit about his office, and we all know who he is, but I would guess many do not actually really know what the Secretary of State's office is responsible for. Uh, then we will talk about voter registration and right to vote kinds of issues, ID and citizenship requirements and so forth. Uh, then we'll talk about double voting or voting fraud and recent laws in Kansas and his office's responsibility in enforcing those laws. Uh, we may talk a little bit also about any efforts his office may be engaged in to, to improve voting processes and methods in Kansas. 
uh, and I think that'll give us quite a bit of territory. So let's begin, Mr. Secretary, with, if you don't mind, maybe kind of telling the audience just a little bit about the Secretary of State's office, your duties, the staff, how many lawyers you use, what, how you spend your, your time on a week-to-week -week sure. basis. Well, I think most people are familiar with the office. At least its primary responsibility and the chief responsibility of Secretaries of State across the country is to be the chief elections officer uh, for the state. Not every state has a Secretary of State. There are a handful that uh, assign those responsibilities either to a, a board. Uh, some states like uh, Alaska have a lieutenant governor that uh, assumes the Secretary of State's responsibilities, but the vast majority do have a Secretary of State uh, that, and, and all of the ones that have one, uh, the primary responsibility is administering the election system. Uh, a second responsibility that virtually every Secretary of State in the country has and that we have in Kansas is registering businesses. So if you start a business in Kansas, whether you, it's a corporation, an S-Corp, an LLC, whatever it may be, um, chances are you will have to register it with the Secretary of State's office. Um, secured debt is registered with the Secretary of State's office as well. Um, a third responsibility that virtually every Secretary of State has and we have it in Kansas is um, notaries public are uh, commissioned or certified uh, by the secretaries of state. So in, in a way, the uh, secretary is like the notary in chief. Uh, and, and that responsibility is also manifest when the governor signs. If the governor appoints someone to a commission, then I countersign his signature. If the governor issues a proclamation, I countersign his signature, essentially being the governor's notary. So there are uh, those are the three big responsibilities that, it, that virtually every secretary of state has. And then the, that's where the secretaries uh, diverge across the country after that, it's just a, a hodgepodge of responsibilities, and I like to use the analogy, it's the Secretary of State's like the utility infielder of state government. If the legislature thinks of something that they want an executive officer to do, and it doesn't fit in any obvious basket, they usually throw it to the Secretary of State. So, for example, we regulate cemeteries uh, in Kansas. Who knew, right? I didn't even know that before I, I assumed the office. But it's actually a really interesting business because, you know, a cemetery that isn't sort of a profit-seeking business in the normal sense, and you have to maintain the business long after all the plots are, are sold. So anyway, it, it requires a degree of state regulation unlike other types of businesses. Um, we have a safe at home program to uh, help uh, uh, endangered women who may be stalked or may, may need a, a, an anonymity in their address. So we have a, 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 a wide variety of other things that we do, but the big ones are voting and registering businesses. Okay, so tell us a little bit about how you accomplish these tasks. I mean, what kind of staff Mostly lawyers, non-lawyers, how do you? Uh, mostly non-lawyers and uh, mostly career staff. There are, uh, I think there are roughly 45 uh, in our office right now. It fluctuates with retirements and such, but uh, the office has shrunk a great deal, and most secretaries of state offices have shrunk a great deal uh, over the past 20 years just because so much has gotten online now. You can register your business online. You can file your annual reports online. You don't need to necessarily speak to a person on the telephone or come up to a desk in person anymore. And that really makes doing business a lot easier for, uh, for most people. Uh, and so uh, in our office, we have a total of um, three attorneys plus me, four attorneys total. Uh, and the three, that, uh, the three other than me are you know, full-time doing legal work all day long. Okay. Well, let's, let's switch to voter registration uh, and, and ID and citizenship issues. But before we get there, you want to, would you talk just a little bit? I mean, you and I have both taught constitutional law. You know, any perspectives you want to offer on, on what the Constitution or Kansas state law actually says about eligibility to vote, right to vote, those sorts of things? Sure. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, maybe some of the law students here or, or anyone who's a lawyer or been to law school or anyone who studies our Constitution really carefully will notice is that the, um, the constitutional provisions governing vote don't say uh, American citizens have, you know, U.S. citizens have this right and that right, and the right is, is conveyed on these terms. It says the franchise shall not be denied on account of race. The franchise shall not be denied on account of sex. The franchise shall not, so it's framed in the negative. Now, why is that? The reason is that the Founding Fathers uh, envisioned that the states would have very different uh, franchises, and indeed they did at the time our country was founded, and they also had very different qualifications. In some states like Pennsylvania, you had property qualifications. Most of those property qualifications disappeared by the Civil War, uh, but the, the idea of conveying, the, it is a right, but the, the Founding Fathers saw it as a right to be conveyed by your state constitution, and then the federal constitution comes in as an overlay and says, okay, fine, you states convey the right, but it shall not be denied according to these terms. So it's a, it's a really interesting right 
uh, you know, unlike many, we think of as our federal constitution as the primary guarantor of the right. Really, voting is, is provided by the state constitutions, and then there are protections on it over that given by the federal constitution. Yeah, so not really anything enumerated in the Bill of Rights, like freedom of speech or right, freedom of religion. Right, You won't see the, in the first ten amendments, you don't find the, the voting right, uh, but it is there. It's just it's guaranteed by the states, and, and the Supreme Court has, over time, described it as a fundamental right, even though it's not expressly enumerated in our Bill of Rights. And the Constitution itself creates kind of an interesting and, what shall we say, ill-defined, to some extent, relationship between federal control and state control over qualifications and elections themselves. Yeah, so this is what the Constitution says. In Article One, Section 2, it says, uh, the qualifications for voting for your member of Congress shall be the same in each state as the qualifications for voting for the most numerous branch of the state legislature. In other words, for the State House of Representatives. The Founding Fathers confronted this debate and they decided they did not want to set a national standard for who is qualified to vote because, as I mentioned, you had these differing opinions among the states about who should be qualified. And so they just said, you're, you're, if you can vote for Congress if you uh, can vote for the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So Article One, Section 2 sets the qualification power squarely in the states and, and it's on that power that we rest uh, our decision in Kansas to require proof of citizenship. Um, and the Supreme Court has unequivocally, unequivocally held over the years that if the state possesses the power to set the qualifications, the state also possesses the power to enforce those qualifications, which is essentially what a, a documentary proof of citizenship law does. Um, on the other hand, Article <coughs> 1, Section 4 uh, is the times, place, or manner provision, which says states set the time, place, and manner of elections as well, but Congress can uh, supersede the states regarding the time, place, and manner of elections. And there's this uh, interesting tension that the Supreme Court wrestled with two years ago. Uh, well, you know, where do those two butt up against each other? What is clearly in the registration clause? What is clearly in the time, place, or manner clause? So for example, or, or, sorry, the qualifications clause. So for example, I would argue that registration is about who's qualified to vote. If you're registered, you have been recognized as qualified to vote. That's squarely in state authority. But some would argue that no, the, the congressional power can step into that too. It's not just time, place, and manner in the sense of on election day, but that Congress can reach into the manner of how you register people too. So, and, and the National Voter Registration Act is an example of that. Congress sort of stepping beyond the traditional time, place, and manner and going into registration. Okay, so anything in particular you'd like to comment on Kansas law? I mean, before we, anything besides the ID and proof of citizenship, which we'll get into, but yeah, any sure. other requirements under state law? Okay, so, um, well, we should mention Marion County versus Crawford, which I assume probably some of the earlier panels talked about, uh, and that, of course, was the two, 2008 Supreme Court decision, U.S. Supreme Court, 6-3 decision, uh, Justice Stevens authoring the opinion, recognizing that the, um, that, that Indiana's photo ID law did not fundamentally inhibit or burden a person's right to vote. So that decision really cleared the way for Kansas and for about 10 or so other states in 2011 to adopt photo ID laws. The Supreme Court ruled on that. Um, that didn't mean that there weren't other angles that lawyers would try to challenge some of these laws, especially under state constitutions. For example, Missouri's uh, photo ID law, which I believe was adopted in 07 maybe, um, that was struck down by the Missouri Supreme Court, not on federal constitutional grounds, but on state constitutional grounds. And of course, your state constitutional provisions will be worded differently than their equivalent uh, provisions in the federal constitution. So anyway, uh, but that was a big one. Uh, that, you know, basically, there's not a federal constitutional barrier to photo ID laws. And then um, Arizona versus Intertribal Council is another big one, uh, and that is very much shaping the debate of proof of citizenship. In that decision, the Supreme Court recognized that yes, the states do have the right to set qualifications and enforce them with proof of citizenship laws, but Congress did have the right uh, to pass the National Voter Registration Act, which says that the states shall accept and use the federal form. The question in that case was, well, Arizona asked this agency that controls the form, please put proof of citizenship on the form because that's what we now have in our Arizona law. Uh, the, the agency deadlocked, it was a two to two vote, they needed a three votes to, to do anything to change the form. And so it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yeah, you gotta use this form. Uh, yes, Arizona has the right, so we therefore urge Arizona to request again that the agency changed the form. <laughs> it was kind of like the court kicked the can down the road. And Arizona and Kansas then made that request. 
uh, and the case started all over again, went up to the Tenth Circuit. The Supreme Court didn't take it this time around. And so that's why Kansas is still right now in sort of a, an ongoing discussion with the Election Assistance Commission, which is that federal agency, which, by the way, uh, after it deadlocked, then the commissioners started leaving and doing other things with their lives. And so the agency had no commissioners and didn't even have an executive director. So we were talking to an acting executive director. It was, it was you know, classic you know, Washington, create an agency, then the agency becomes empty, and then make the states say mother may I to the agency that doesn't have anybody in it. Um, so anyway, uh, that, that Arizona versus Intertribal Council is shaping a lot of what we've been doing in Kansas. Uh, so yeah, Kansas law, um, in 2011 we adopted the Secure and Fair Elections Act, that's the one that was alluded to earlier, and that is the act that combined photo ID at the polls, proof of citizenship at the time of registration, and one part that doesn't get nearly as much attention, I don't think it's as controversial to, to some people, I guess, but it's, um, I think, one of the most effective parts of the law, and that is um, equivalent security for mail-in ballots. If you're determined to commit fraud in, in Kansas prior to this law, the easiest way to do it, and in most states, the easiest way to commit voter fraud is with a mail-in ballot. You don't have to face another human being. No one's going to scrutinize you. No one's going to see if you're up to something. And uh, we made sure that our mail-in ballots had equivalent security. And what that meant uh, in practical terms is before, if you uh, wanted an absentee ballot or advanced ballot mail, mail different terms for the same thing, um, you just uh, sent in a form, you, you signed your name, but no one validated, no one checked your signature to see if it matched the signature on file for your name in the state database. Uh, now your signature has to match. And if your signature doesn't match, the county clerk is not going to send you a ballot. The county clerk will send you a note saying there's no signature match. Uh, you can come down to the clerk's office and we'll try to sort that out. You know, signatures do change over time as people age. So, you know, there are allowances. It, didn't, it was on the flat denial. Um, and also, uh, to get your mail-in ballot, you have to write your full Kansas driver's license number, the theory being you're probably not going to have that full number unless you're looking at it in your hand, or send in a photocopy of a, photo, of a qualifying photo ID. So that's the third part of the Kansas law. Um, the Kansas Constitution actually has an interesting provision in it that most state constitutions don't. It says that the uh, legis legislature shall provide proofs of, of the right to vote. So in other words, the, the Kansas legislature was worried about this at the time of constitutional drafting, that, um, that, that you should have to establish your right to vote. So let's talk a little bit about ID and or citizenship. You can take them in order, but why would you argue, and did you argue, you know, articulate the arguments in favor of adding an ID requirement, adding a citizenship requirement? Um, well, okay, so let's, uh, there, there are a wide variety of pieces of evidence that, you know, helped me make my case that we needed this in Kansas. One is, and, and this is often the argument, of, you know, do you have enough fraud to warrant uh, adopting protections that are designed to prevent voter fraud. And so we uh, accumulated a bunch of evidence that was actually uh, accumulated by prior secretaries of state before me taking office, but um, we had it from 1997 to, to 2011, we had 237 cases of uh, credible reports of voter fraud that the county uh, clerks reported to the secretaries of state during that period. And so uh, that was one piece of evidence. So the, the others were, were, were obvious problems in the system. Like, for example, where other people can request your, where, where there was no signature check on the advance ballot request form. I actually was a, a victim of this in an indirect way in 2004. Uh, I was running for Congress in the 3rd Congressional District against then Congressman Dennis Moore, and a, um, a lady came to our election office and she said, uh, Mr. Kobach, I'd like to vote for you. Uh, and I said, great. And she said, I'm a Democrat from Wyandotte County. I said, wow, even better. And then uh, she said, um, but I got my ballot in the mail today. And I was kind of confused. I said, what, what's the problem? And she said, well, I never requested it. Someone else requested my ballot. And uh, so I called the Secretary of State at the time, Ron Thornburg, and, and mentioned this to him. And he said, uh, you know, that sounds really troubling, but the Secretary of State doesn't have any authority to stop that. We don't have any power to investigate, to prosecute. And that was one of the reasons why we pushed for the prosecutorial authority this past year in the Kansas legislature, so that when things like that happen, the Secretary of State can do something about it. But I mentioned that instance because uh, upon further examination, the Wyandotte County uh, Election Office said this wasn't an isolated thing in 2004 and in surrounding, you know, 2006 it was happening as well. But it was happening all the time. People were requesting other people's advanced ballots. Now it's still unclear whether they were doing that to artificially uh, bump up turnout 
in a neighborhood or in a district, or whether they were doing it with the intent to intercept the ballots at, at somebody's mailbox. But either way, it's, it's fraudulently requesting someone else's absentee ballot. So we had individual cases like that. Um, we had a large number of cases of, of non-citizens voting that we presented to, well, registering and voting. And, and this is really interesting. In some cases, you have very, you know, you have a, it's usually local elections that, uh, or, or smaller, or, or a state rep election where, you know, you, you can win that election with, in a, those routinely are decided by a margin of, you know, 30 votes or less. You'd be amazed how many close elections we have for state representative and for city elections. Um, and so we had many cases of uh, non-citizens getting on the voter rolls, and in some cases it was, usually the non-citizen doesn't realize that he or she's breaking the law. Someone tells him, hey, we need you to register to vote, would you please do it? Or in some cases, the, the person goes to the DMV, is getting a driver's license, which you can do if you are lawfully present in the United States and you're, you're, you're here in Kansas, you can get a driver's license. Um, and as you know, at the end of the uh, litany of questions you get at the DMV, the last question is, and would you like to register to vote? And, you know, people uh, here visiting this country say, oh, the nice lady at, at, behind the desk has asked me if I'd like to register to vote. I guess I can register to vote. And so they say yes, because they were just asked, can, would you? And so a lot of people register to vote, non-citizens, quite accidentally. They're not trying to break the law. They're just asked, would you like to? And they say yes. Um, and we found that uh, in the, the county that's been doing the greatest amount of study of this, this was not when the bill was introduced, but since then, is Sedgwick County. And it, it, it shows time and time again, uh, non-citizens get on the voter rolls uh, at the DMV. When the clerk or whoever is asking these questions, you know, it's been a long day. They've talked to 300 people. They didn't just think, oh wait, this person just told me she's here uh, on a visa, she's not a US citizen, but at the end of this series of questions, would you like to register to vote? So it, that happens a lot. Um, and the way we're discovering it actually in Sedgwick County where we're collecting a lot of data uh, is set the Sedgwick County uh, Election Commissioner, uh, who is an officer that I appoint for the four largest counties. Uh, we have a program there where they every Friday they go to the um, uh, naturalization ceremonies and ask newly naturalized citizens, hey, would you like to register to vote? Which I think is a wonderful service that we're doing to make it easy for them to register right then and there. And what we're finding out is that a large number of people who just became naturalized that day they, they, they get them registered, they go back to the election office and they found out, oh, that person's been registered to vote for the past 10 years. And then we look at the voting history and we found, oh, this person actually voted a couple times. So it, it does happen and we discover it actually by providing the service of naturalizing people, or registering them at the naturalization center. So let's take some of the, the arguments against these requirements. So what about the difficulty, and I know you've, you've had some publicity, not that long ago in recent weeks about the number of registration forms that are kind of in suspension, mm -hmm. don't get approved. I mean, what about that side of it? And I know you adopted a rule which may have taken effect just recently. Uh, yeah, last week. To, to deal with that, so comment on that. So when we, um, when we passed the law, the statute on, on proof of citizenship to register, we wanted to make it very easy for people to do this, and we recognize that people don't normally carry their birth certificates or their passports around with them. And so if they go to a voter registration drive on campus or at the shopping center, they're not going to have that with them. And so we said you can send in your registration subsequent. You don't have to hand it in at the same time you fill out the piece of paper, or send in your proof of citizenship uh, subsequently. We also said that you can send it in in multiple mechanisms, allowing for people to text it in to take a picture with their smartphone and email it in, uh, to use the old-fashioned fax machine, fax it, or you can actually bring it into the election office yourself or send it in. So we created multiple ways for people to get that information in. Uh, but what the law didn't specify, but left open to a regulation later to address, was, uh, well, how much time you know, do you give someone to do that? And the two other states that already had proof of citizenship laws in effect at the time were Arizona and Georgia, and they had uh, 30 days and 45 days, respectively, to send in your proof of citizenship. Uh, we had just adopted a reg that says, we're gonna, we're gonna be more generous than that, we're gonna give people 90 days. But one of the reasons that I believe and that the county clerks believe you need to have some time limit is because there really aren't any other examples, if you think about it, of a, of a registration process that is open indefinitely, that you can just start it and then the government keeps a record and then you finish it five years later. Uh, and the problem is we are an incredibly mobile society. So we took a sample of the people on this incomplete list uh, in Sedgwick County, 
sample of 700 and looked at it. Of those 700, 34% had already moved away. And so the county clerk's office, or the county election officer's, uh, commissioner's office, was sending uh, reminder notices to this list of people of which more than a third had already moved away. And so that's another reason why it just made sense to put a reasonable time limit on it. Now, contrary to some media reports, uh, there's no penalty if you fail to send in your proof of citizenship in 90 days. Uh, all you have to do is just fill out the form again. It's five lines, it takes about 60 seconds, and you start, you give yourself another 90 days to do it. So it's in that, you know, that indicates, yeah, you still are intending to go ahead and complete the process. So it, it doesn't disenfranchise anyone. There's no purging. It is, uh, uh, that word is illogical. It's impossible to be purged from a list that one is not on. Um, and it's, uh, I think, a common sense rule. So let's take the sort of the, one of the big criticisms of these laws. I mean, they certainly challenged as being discriminatory, either in purpose or effect, and certainly partisan, often viewed as more a Republican issue probably than a Democratic issue. I mean, what do you say to those kinds of... I have been Search. thinking about those criticisms a lot because those criticisms were not levied in the Kansas legislature in 2011. There was a sea change on this issue between 2011 and 2012. In 2011, uh, how many people, no, I can't really ask this. Uh, be, here's, a, here's a bit of surprising information. In 2011, when we passed this law, uh, two-thirds of the Democrats in the Kansas House voted for it including Paul Davis, who's involved in a recent lawsuit uh, involving the 90-day rule. Two-thirds and three-quarters of the Kansas Democrats in the Kansas, in, in the, in the Kansas Senate voted in favor uh, of these laws. It was not a partisan issue in the Kansas legislature in 2011. Um, similarly, Rhode Island, was it, Kansas was one of the earlier states in that year, but there was a slew of other states that did it. Uh, Rhode Island was one of the states that adopted photo ID. They didn't do proof of citizenship in the, in the mail-in ballot provisions. But Rhode Island, uh, the legislature was controlled in both houses by the Democrat Party, and they adopted photo ID in 2011. Uh, the leader, he was, I can't remember if he was majority leader or if he was the committee leader, but the, the sort of leader of the charge uh, for photo ID in Rhode Island uh, was African American. And he was interviewed about this because starting toward the end of the year, there were these claims being made, well, maybe this issue is, you know, somehow has some racial bias to it. And this African-American proponent of the bill who carried the bill uh, in Rhode Island said, you know, I, I hear what some people in the National Democrat Party are saying, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing his quote in the newspaper, but he said, God gave me a brain, and this just makes sense. And so, you know, people weren't really buying that argument, uh, and certainly not in Kansas. Uh, then the sea change occurred, I believe, in large part because the Obama Justice Department, Eric Holder, uh, decided that they were going to push the issue and, and try to take an angle of attack in court and say, well, maybe there's some sort of racial disparity here. Maybe there's some sort of racial bias. And, you know, I think the argument itself is a little bit dicey, if not racist itself, to say that a person's skin color affects his ability to have a photo ID or a person's skin color affects his or her ability to go to a government office and get a free ID, which of course you can get a free ID in all of the states that have photo ID, um, where previously you couldn't. Previously you could not get a free photo ID. Um, and so, I, you know, it, it, that is a backstop to make sure that there is no poll tax, to make sure that there is no impediment. Um, and then this is the other thing that I, I really view that argument with skepticism. So this is a Survey USA News poll. Um, done in Kansas uh, right before the November 2010 election. So it was 11:04. Um, so November 4th, 2010, was a big issue in my in my particular uh, campaign and in, in, in the issue of, of Secretary of State in that year. Because um, I had already said on the campaign trail I was going to try to bring proof of citizenship and photo ID to Kansas. Um, should a person registering to vote in Kansas for the first time be required to provide proof of citizenship? 84 uh, percent of respondents said yes. Uh, among African American respondents, it was 92% yes. Um, should Kansas voters be required to provide a valid photo ID at their polling place? 85% uh, yes. Among African American respondents, 84% yes. So the argument that was made by some leaders who were holding themselves out to be spokesmen for certain racial groups was not matching what 
people exercising their common sense were saying in, respond, in, in responding to polls, that they wanted these laws, just like the rest of Kansans did in, in roughly the same percentages. So I just think the argument is, it, it was pushed down as a theory, a way of attacking these laws, and it, it just doesn't make sense to me. So you don't see it as a partisan issue now? Well, it um, has become partisan, absolutely. But at the time in 2011, when these laws were adopted, it wasn't partisan in Kansas, wasn't partisan in Rhode Island, wasn't partisan in a lot of states. Now, some states became you know, more partisan about it sooner, sooner. Well, let's talk then about something you've already mentioned. So you mentioned examples of voting fraud, if you will. I, I suppose there are also innocent examples. I think you've mentioned, I've seen before, people double voting just because they forget they've already voted. But talk about the new law that you, you get the power now to pursue, investigate, and prosecute cases. And sure. And, and I, I just offer one small correction. There was some reporting about uh, you know double voting cases. You can't double vote if you forget you've already voted. In other words, that's not a, first of all, Kansas and most states have a system of preventing you from doing that. There will be, if you've already voted by advance ballot, uh, you, there is a up-to-the-minute list every polling place has and every voting place in Kansas of uh, all the people who've already voted. It's recorded on the poll book and then they're updated the night before. So you, will, you won't be able to vote twice. You come in and say, I'd like to vote. The person, the, the poll worker will say, well, it uh, looks like that, Mrs. Smith, you've already voted uh, absentee, um, but I'm going to give you this provisional ballot. They're always offered a provisional ballot just in case some mistake was made. Um, so they, you would vote the second time a provisional ballot, but that would not be uh, a crime. But at any rate, um, Kansas does have this authority now at the state level. We were finding that a lot of these cases were being referred to the county attorneys, and the county attorneys in most counties are just swamped. You know, they're dealing with arson cases, rape cases, murder cases. In western Kansas, you'll have county attorneys covering more than one county, and then they get this one voter fraud case, and they've never had a voter fraud case before. It, doesn't seem that important, it goes to the bottom of the stack. And so most of the times the cases weren't even getting investigated. And we presented to the legislature evidence of these, these double voting cases, real double voting, where a person's voting in two different counties in Kansas or voting in two different states in the same election and uh, doing it willfully. And we tracked those because those are, those are pretty easy cases to prove. You have a written document in Kansas, the signature on the poll book saying, I'm voting, I'm here voting today. And you have the same signature voting in, you know, name the other state, Alabama, uh, saying I'm voting today, here's my signature requesting an absentee ballot. Um, so we looked at those cases, which are, you know, not that intensive in terms of investigation. And uh, even those cases were not being followed up on. So that's why we presented to the legislature the concept of, well, let's have state officials get in the game too, because the county officials are evidently too busy. So the attorney general can come in and prosecute, and the secretary of state's office can prosecute. Uh, and those are the most obvious, and, and there's quite a few cases. It's amazing how easy it is to double vote. Um, no state in America has the power to, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't say this is being streamed, but if there are any uh, you know, voting people who want to commit voter fraud, no state in America has the power to stop you from double voting before it happens, because your, your polling places are not connected electronically. There's no streaming, or not, wouldn't be streaming, but there's no live update of who's voted at what time. And so it's not as if one polling place can talk to another polling place and say, oh, this person already voted. So you'll probably get away with it on the day, but we can detect it after it occurs. And we detect it after it occurs in part because Kansas is the host of a project of about 30 states where we share our voter records and we share our voter history. So if we see the same person with the same name, same date of birth and same last four social is voting in two different states on the same day, uh, then we can, we can follow up and we can go after uh, that individual. And you'd be surprised how many people get away with it. Oh, okay, I'll do it again next time. I'll do it again next time. And so you do have some serial double, vo double voters, which, uh, which we have seen in our office. So and are your three lawyers devoted to this at this time? Or do you, yeah. have you filed any cases? Where do you stand we on will that? Be, we will be filing the first cases within the next, within the next week. Um, the reason we're filing them right now is we face a statute of limitations. There's a five-year statute of limitations for voting crimes. Uh, and so if someone committed the, a fraudulent act in 2010, it's now 2015, it's election time that, you know, it's October, November. So we have to get the cases filed now. Okay. 
Well, before we get to the, the public's opportunity to ask you some questions, I wanted, you mentioned one uh, thing you were doing, like at the naturalization ceremonies and getting yeah. people. Are there other things the office is doing to get people into the voting process? Or also, if you comment on anything you might be doing to make the voting process itself in whatever way, work better in Kansas. Sure. Um, so yeah, we're, we're uh, going to naturalization ceremonies in, in some of the larger counties, um, Sedgwick County being the one that's really doing a great job of this, and, and I'm hoping that the other big counties will be uh, following the, following suit. Um, we've also got a Vote Kansas app, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, you can it's definitely available on Apple. I think we've got the Android version out now too. So if you go to your app store and, and look for it, you should be able to find it. That's helpful because it. It'll tell you a number of things. Uh, you can go to, go on that, uh, use that app on your phone. You can find out where your polling place is. You can confirm that you are registered, and it will also give you directions to the polling place, uh, as I think the latest version of it does. So, you know, that's just helpful because the last thing you want to do is, and this has happened to me before, when your polling place, you live in a neighborhood where the polling place has been shifted from your, from election to election. It's, it's election day morning. You wake up. Uh, I got to vote. I don't, I don't remember where it is. You can look at that app. So that that makes it easier. Um, on the day. You know, we're trying to uh, encourage people to vote. But, you know, one thing that I've seen looking at the whole, you know, I've been looking at the issue of voting as a professor, of course, before I became Secretary of State, and lo looking at what other states do. All Secretaries of State, we're trying to find ways to encourage people to vote and, you know, get out the vote, get people interested in voting. We have a cyber civics uh, website. Check out our sos.ks.gov. Uh, and click the cyber civics. It's just trying to get people interested, get school kids interested in history and politics and government. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the best thing that gets people interested in voting is a really interesting race, a contentious race between candidates that people are interested in. Nothing drives turnout like a good contest. And you see that. if um, In elections where Kansas doesn't have uh, a statewide officer on the ballot, which would be, a, and the presidential election looks like a, you know, a walk. Kansas is, is, as many people here know, not usually contested in the presidential general election, not since 1964 as Kansas voted a Democrat. In a so neither party spends any money getting out the vote in a presidential cycle. You will not be getting phone calls from the Republican or Democrat campaign in 2016, urging you, to, or at least it would be unprecedented if you did. Um, and so in those years, in presidential election years, if you don't have a statewide contest that is really getting people excited and interested, you may not have uh, a huge turnout because neither, nothing gets people interested like, you know, a phone call from a campaign or, or, or interest in a candidate. And so, you know, that's where we see the fluctuations in turnout. It's usually driven more by who's running than by what some government official is doing to, to you know, prod people to the polls. Okay, well, let's let's tackle one last topic, and then Reggie, if you're ready, we'll. The the Supreme Court. We were talking before this started. The Supreme Court has granted review in a case that comes out of Texas, where the question is: for 50 years, the court has recognized the principle of one person, one vote, which is why, for example, a few years ago, secretaries involved, Kansas went through the redistricting process that occurs after every census, and we try to make all the districts the same size, basically population. Well, this Texas case raises an interesting question, which is should it be equal size in population or should it be equal size in eligible voters? Because you could have districts that have the same population but have very different numbers of actual eligible voters in them. And so that's in play. And I don't know if you want to, you, yeah. you just wanted to talk a little bit about the census too and its limitations. And So this is a really big issue. Um, and you, it's probably one that most people haven't thought about, but it, it, if you think about it, it makes a big difference on your power as a voting citizen. So the census does not ask your citizenship. It asks where you were born. The census tracks uh, people born in the United States and people born outside the United States, but that does not correlate with citizenship because, of course, we have many, many millions of naturalized citizens in the United States. So when you divvy up the congressional districts equally according to population, you are doing it without looking at whether the population are, includes citizens or non-citizens in that district. So what happens is there are some districts that are notorious, particularly in California over the last few decades, where you have a ton of non-citizens living in a district. So let's just use a round number, 750,000 people in a district. Well, the 750,000 people in a district in eastern Kansas, it, probably 730,000 of them are going to be U.S. citizens. 
but in a district in some parts of California, of that 750,000, 400,000 are gonna be non-citizens. And so you only have 350,000 citizens there. Now think about that. The number of citizens in that district is half the number of citizens in our district here in the third district of Kansas. So those voters have twice as, twice as much power uh, with their individual vote as we do here. And so I think it's been a long time overdue for the Supreme Court to address this question. Should we be looking at the number of warm bodies or should we be looking at the number of citizens? And I would argue you look at the number of citizens unless you just don't care if uh, districts are of grossly disproportionate size when it comes to the number of eligible voters. Okay, well I think that's a good place to turn to our public questions. Uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for those questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for those responses. Now it's your turn. Uh, their microphones are available uh, on the side walkways, not the middle one. Uh, so please step right up. Uh, please pose your question in the form of a question, as they say on Jeopardy. Uh, and um, let's start right over here. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, for everybody who's interested in uh, a national proposed uh, policy that would solve all this and more, look to Robert David Steele, former Marine and uh, CIA uh, officer who proposes the um, Open Power, the Electoral Reform Act of 2015. Um, but a very interesting conversation about what ultimately is the uh, patina on the chairs of the uh, Titanic um, meanwhile, over here in the mainland of the fullness of the facts and public reason, there is a real threat to the constitutional republic called uh, mass election fraud, which was not brought up one time. So I want, I want to give you, Mr. Kobach, Mr. Secretary, the chance to come clean, because I perceive you as a very nice man and a good family man. However, you've aligned yourself with, um, uh, you know, the people who have... Uh, who have frauded the elections over the decades, basically. So a couple data points for you to respond to is um, there's a man named uh, Clinton Curtis who actually testified to Congress, I'll spare you all all the data that's in here though, who, that he was an IT consultant back before the 2000 election who was tasked to write software that could flip the vote to 51 to 49 on any uh, electronic voting machine, and he did so. And that is on the record in Congress, um, and that also had to do with the 2004 Ohio election, too. Second data point to respond to would be Mike uh, Connell, who I think is really closer to your position in a way. He was Karl Rove's IT czar for a long time, a good Christian man. I think he was used by the Bush administration because he thought he would help save uh, children by getting uh, you know, pro-life people on the Supreme Court. But he ended up being subpoenaed in 2008 um, and the run-up to the election, and then was said that he had been threatened by Karl Rove and then died in a black operation uh, in his plane. And then afterwards, the study by the FBI had information from a uh, black operator who said that they had been tasked because he had been deemed a national security threat because he knew. I think we have we have the two data points. Yes. So please respond to that, and 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 it's a chance for you to come clean about the the case down in Wichita involving the uh, apparent uh, election fraud. Thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so much to address. Okay. I I don't think I have to come clean about anything. The 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 argument is that that there's. I, I assume the argument. You're in, uh, in implying or suggesting outright is that there's massive election fraud that's being engineered by people who program these machines and they program them to somehow yield you know, uh, results that are not reflecting the results of the actual votes of the people. Um, I don't know the names of the individuals you've described, uh, so I can't uh, comment on them. Um, look, I'm not aligned with any company that produces a machine. I'm not aligned with any uh, you know, massive uh, endeavor of this sort. But the, you might have read about the, the, the lady in Wichita. She's a statistician who works for Wichita State. 
uh, she's asked, can she do an audit where she takes an entire district in Wichita and looks at the, um, the tapes that the machines produce, looks at the, the ballots themselves, and uh, just do her own personal audit for the purposes of her research. Now, her research is not, she doesn't allege massive fraud. She says there's a pattern, not in Kansas, but nationwide, and not, not solely in Kansas. Also in Kansas. Yeah, You're right. She, she, her pattern uh, that she alleges is that in certain larger precincts, if I'm stating her theory correctly, in larger precincts, there tends to be a, uh, a slight tilt toward incumbents rather than in, so that in, in theory, the size of the precinct shouldn't affect the average tilt toward incumbent or challenger. That's her theory, and she wants to use some Wichita ballots as a laboratory to test the theory. I, I think it's an interesting theory. It, it, it should be tested at some point. Um, but Kansas law says very clearly that after the election contest period and recount period have ended, uh, the ballots are sealed. And the county election, it's actually a crime for the county election officer to unseal the ballots. You can, you can look at them during this period when you're challenging a particular election, but you can't go into them after the fact. Uh, after the, fact. the reason the legislature did that was because if you have very small precincts, you might be able to deduce how certain people voted. Um, other states have less stringent laws that allow for audits like the one she wants to do. Um, again, I'm not opposed to auditing, but I am about following the law, and the law is crystal clear on this. In fact, she brought a similar request a couple of years ago, and a judge in Sedgwick County said, no, the law is clear, you can't have access to the but, ballot. But so she, she did yeah. find that it was associated with We're very specific machines by I'm the sorry, Maker sir. Election System Software, okay. who's owned by the McCarthy Group up in uh, Nebraska, apparently uh, establishment Republican operatives. Let, let me and that'll be it, because then we have other people that have questions. And, to and let me just, I'll give you one more response to, you know, look, we test these machines in Kansas. Um, I, although I believe our testing is, is very thorough, and, and Kansas law requires every single one of our 105 counties to have a public test of the machines that you can attend so that they run, they, they you know, have a series of 100 votes for candidate A, candidate B. They make sure the machine yields a count that is accurate, and, and the public can attend those tests. And then the best test of all is when there's a recount. And, and the recounts happen all the time, all across the state. We just had one this spring in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, st a city uh, election, city council. The margin of victory was one vote. And the scanners said, you know, which is how the votes were counted in the first place, paper ballots with scanners, um, said one vote. And so the person who was behind said, I want a hand recount. They did a hand recount of these thousands of ballots, and again, the margin was one vote, one vote, exactly what the machines said. That said, I know that machines can malfunction. They do malfunction. And so that's why I have pushed all of our 105 counties in Kansas. It's not malfunction when someone if I could programs just finish. it to, to fraud but, people. The, well, you'll, you'll be happy with what I'm what about Curtis, to say. That's what, what Curtis said. He said that, that a county supervisor would quote not even, he said that they would let me, never let me just answer. see it. Let, let, well, let him let respond me, let me and then we'll move you. to the next if, question. If this doomsday scenario ever materialized in Kansas, if we get to the point where every one of our 105 counties has, pa has a paper trail, yes. which I am pushing them toward, right now we're up to about 90 counties. Not a paper having, trail, hand-counted paper. What, paper. what you can do when you have a paper trail, where you have the paper ballot, or you have a paper, it's kind of like a receipt, a tape, that is attached to an electronic voting machine, then you can look at the machine's total, and then you can have actual human beings counting the paper that the voters themselves saw before it went into the box, and you can verify that no, no funny business occurred, and, and I'm pushing all 105 counties. I can't mandate that they do that because that would be me mandating them to buy new equipment. But what I am using is the power of the state subsidy. I, I, the Secretary of State's office subsidizes the purchase of new equipment for each county, and I said right after taking office that I will not subsidize the purchase of any equipment that does not produce a paper trail because I share some of the suspicion, not that there's a massive you know, uh, scandal going on, but that there are machines that do malfunction, and therefore we need a paper trail. And so we are moving that direction in Kansas, and within a few years we will have all 105 counties with a paper trail. This microphone over here, yes, sir. Uh, good evening. My name is Rich Crank, and I have what could be a potential problem, and it, deals, it deals with that citizenship question, because although my Kansas driver's license, which I've had for a long time, um, has my father's surname, my Puerto Rican birth certificate uses the Spanish naming convention, and so my mother's maiden name is listed as my last name on it. Now, that, that's pretty easily explainable. 
but it was only today that KDHE has said that they will issue birth certificates to same-sex couples. Um, and so the reality is people could use it, use the, the difference in the surnames to prevent my vote from being counted. The, uh, the short answer is we anticipated that, not in necessarily a case like yours, but uh, women, many women who have uh, a married name that is different from their birth name uh, have that issue. Their, their name today is not the same as their name on their birth certificate. So that, that's addressed in the law. All you have to do is uh, when you register to vote, if you show the birth certificate, you just sign an affidavit. Yeah, my birth name was Smith, my, my name is now Brown, and it, that's all. So you, it doesn't matter if your birth certificate name, uh, surname, deviates from your current name. And if you had an, a, a name change, like a complete name change, then you can swear that by affidavit, too. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir, over here. Yeah, Mr. Kobach, um, good evening. My name is Stuart Howe. I'm a Kansas resident. First, I want to thank you for being here and helping foster what uh, I believe JFK referred to as an informed and engaged citizenry. That's a, a big umbrella remedy for everything, so thank you for that. Um, I have uh, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, in light of the fact that the intent of the law is clearly, you know, uh, wonderful that, you know, people that should be able to vote do get to vote and, and the opposite doesn't happen. And that, uh, you know, it's also true that it really doesn't matter who votes, who votes for what uh, compared to who counts the votes. I think we have an issue there. My two questions would be, one, uh, in your background when you went through Yale, I know you did, uh, in, in addition to other schools, before you joined with John Ashcroft just before 9-11, what, if anything, either officially or unofficially, as far as relationship, did you have with Skull and Bones while you were there? Oh. <laughs> was, just uh, one of two. <laughs> I was not a member of Skull and Bones. I was a law student at Yale. I don't think they would have taken law students even if I had been interested. But I, think, I think it's an undergraduate uh, secret society. But no, no relationship. Okay, walked by the tomb a couple times and thought that's an odd building sort of thing? Uh, you know, I, I never was quite sure where the building was. But <laughs> they don't have a big sign out front in no, neon saying Skull and Bones. So. No arrows? Okay. <laughs> no. okay. And, and the other is, um, you know, Beth Clarkson that was mentioned, the statistician that's following someone else's hypothesis, uh, I just wanted to point out something and ask a question about that. It seems, uh, it was shocking to me to see the graphs that are directly representational of the numbers and how only certain machines consistently had these anomalies uh, and in favor of certain types of candidates and only, as you pointed out, in larger uh, you know, larger districts, I think above 500 or 1,000 or 600 or 1,000. So that's troubling. And uh, so the question in relation to that would be, since the intent of all these laws and everything, you know, uh, that you're involved in as far as going to Sedgwick County, I believe, and stopping that procedure from going forward that Beth Clarkson wanted to have happen so that there can be a redress of the county, uh, the law that you specify, even though it may be, it, it may be a, a, a legal uh, roadblock to having this happen in the interest of justice and having you know, votes count, I don't believe it's, it's lawful. And I was hoping you could address how it is that you could possibly justify blocking on whatever grounds the finding out that our votes count and that we actually have representational government. It seems like a, a minor technicality in the letter of a law which may not be representational of justice or lawfulness, if you get the distinction, I'm sure you do. So well, thank you. you know, I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer, and I'm, you know, once you kind of get that legal mindset, you know, if, there are lots of things that you might say, gosh, it'd be really cool if we could do this. And then you say, oh, there's a law that says we can't. Okay, then at that point, I just say, look, that's a barrier. I'm not going to try to break the law. I'm not going to try to skirt around the law. And that's, you know, that's the way I look at immigration. And I know a lot of people look at illegal immigration and say, well, yeah, that's the law, but gosh, it's, you know, the person's nice and the law's antique, antiquated, whatever. I, I'm, I'm very simple about it, black and white. The law says we can't do it. That said, I've got nothing against audits. And indeed, many other states have much more permissive statutes concerning how you can, you know, who can have access to the ballots, who can perform an audit afterwards. So I'm kind of surprised that uh, Ms. Clarkson, the lady in, at Wichita State, hasn't gone to other states, and said, which have much more permissive uh, statutes, and just done her audit there, because it's nothing unique to Kansas. The other thing she could have done uh, is she could just uh, participate in a recount. 
because a recount is a true audit. You are auditing all of the ballots in that jurisdiction, in that race. Isn't and she after the, the statistics, the, the, code, the codification, the numbers that would allow her to do that, and that's what being, she's being blocked access to by the law? Well, the, I'll, let the, you, let, I'll let you respond to this, and then we'll move okay, to the and It's question. actually two statutes. There's the one that uh, makes it a crime for the county election officer to unseal the ballots, and then there's another law that just says that these uh, the, the information on ballots cannot be um, disclosed after the contest period. And so there's two statutes that really don't offer any wiggle room here. Uh, but the kind of information she'd like is where states have auditing, you know, that some states have auditing laws that say uh, every jurisdiction every so many years shall have an audit and this is the information that shall be addressed. You know, we could have that in Kansas. Uh, I'm not opposed to us moving that direction, but right now the law is the law, and I'm not going to break it. Yeah, this is the last thing I'm sitting down, but, you know, the Third Reich, they changed a lot of things and made things legal and illegal. I think ones that don't serve justice, they need to go somehow. Thank you for your time. Next question, over here. Uh, good evening, Mr. Secretary. Uh, to your uh, last point you made about counting uh, eligible voters versus warm bodies. Uh, it's a two-part question, and then I'll sit down to let you answer. Uh, do we count prisoners, and do we count people on military bases? And if, uh, if those are different circumstances than what you were talking about, how do you justify that? Yeah, great question, and actually uh, answers that you might not be aware of. Okay, so yes, we do count prisoners uh, in the census, and we do count prisoners, uh, for the, obviously, for the purposes of apportioning representation. Um, <laughs> Military. So Kansas has two forts, and, and we have other military installations as well. And we have um, something that most states don't have anymore, and that is we have a census adjustment. So after, uh, and we have lots of colleges in Kansas. So after the official U.S. Census comes in, uh, Kansas, pursuant to Kansas law, we send out uh, information to the bases and to the universities, allowing individuals to select whether they want to be uh, deemed a resident of the base or a resident of their home state, wherever that might be. And at universities, they may be deemed a resident in the university town or in the hometown, wherever that may be. And so for those two communities, the military bases and uh, college campuses, the, the census numbers are actually adjusted in Kansas for the purposes of doing our statewide elections. And actually, uh, prior to about, would, I'm going to say the 1950s or 60s, most states had their own census. The, the convention of the federal government being the only census around and they're the only entity that does a census. Actually, most states had it, their own census. Kansas got rid of its census and this statute was passed, I'm, if I'm remembering it correctly, I think 1978, and we replaced it with our census adjustment, which is where we take the federal numbers and then we adjust them for students and military. So the answer is we give the military members their choice. Do they want to be Kansans for the purpose of representation or do they want to be counted uh, in some other state? And prisoners uh, are counted um, the states vary widely on what happens if you commit a felony to your, your franchise. Uh, in Kansas, you are not permanently, some states permanently bar you from voting if you've committed a felony. Other states do nothing to your franchise if you've committed a felony, and you can vote from prison if you want. Kansas is in the middle. Uh, we say that during the period of state supervision, so whatever your total sentence is, um, you will lose your franchise, but then you can vote again after that five-year, ten-year period is up. Uh, so we're kind of in the middle. You temporarily lose your franchise in Kansas. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> you gave this number, but I missed it. You said, what was the number of documented fraud cases? Uh, 237 that we presented to the legislature. And uh, over how, how long a time? Uh, 97, to 200, 97 to 2011. Okay. Um, then in, in your talk, you used the phrase a lot a couple of times, especially when you were talking about non-citizens getting registered at the DMV. Where, where would we find out what those numbers are? Well, the, uh, the 237 uh, was presented oh, no, in no, the chart. The, the a lot numbers. Okay, I'll, I'll give you some more detail uh, on those. Th that was presented, in, you asked where could you find the numbers. Yeah. Uh, that, it's on the legislative record in the, the election committees that was, it, it's, you know, when you, if, uh, if a Professor McAllister go, wants to go testify, he'll write a written testimony, and the testimony will be on the record of that committee. So it's, it's part of the legislative record. Um, I've used those numbers many times, and, and the charts are, have been, you know, been made, made public. Reporters have had a chance to look at them. Um, the, a lot, in terms of uh, the non-citizens voting, uh, in the case 
involving the Election Assistance Commission that I mentioned in the wake of Arizona versus Intertribal Council, the case where Kansas and Arizona sued, uh, we presented uh, 20 uh, non-citizens that we had, which is a very small sample, uh, 20 non-citizens that we found on our voter rolls just by looking at the driver's license database. If, if, the driver's, if you're an alien legally residing in the United States, you can get your driver's license, but it'll be denoted after the Real ID Act of 2005, your driver's license expires when your uh, time of lawful residence expires. And so that's noted. So we were able to just quickly look at these non-citizens and note that they were registered. So that was 20 that we presented to the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas in the case of Kobach versus Election Assistance Commission. Uh, I'll soon be presenting another uh, list of, of non-citizens uh, voting. It, it's going to be a similar number uh, that we've discovered since then. I mentioned the case of Sedgwick County doing these naturalization ceremony registrations, and we've been documenting all of the cases that we've discovered there, too. So, uh, and that one will be publicizing probably in the next month or so. So it takes some digging to find this. Yeah, you know, if you look at our voter rolls, it doesn't say citizen, non-citizen. You know, there's, if that's one of the things I think, you know, a lot of people may not rec recognize is, say you, you, you recognize that people may accidentally or intentionally get registered and they're non-citizens, you can't go into the voter rolls and then just pull those people out. It's, it's like searching for a needle in a haystack being blindfolded with gloves on. There's just no way you can tell who's a citizen and who's not a citizen. So if you want to address the problem, you have to address it on the front end and create a, a filter so that non-citizens can't get into the registration batch in the first place, into the haystack in the first place. Okay, thank you. Over here, sir. Thank you for coming, Mr. Secretary. Sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on proposed uh, measures for automatic voter registration? Um, yeah, so there was a, a big bill that and I say big because it was physically big, it had a lot of elements to it, and it, would, it was really comprehensive that um, uh, Senator Schumer from New York had proposed, and there were other co-sponsors, and that was, it was an automatic registration bill. Automatic registration basically says, if you're on any government list, you're registered. Just, it, you, boom, you're registered. All, all the lists are just dumped uh, into the uh, statewide voter registration database. Um, I'm opposed to automatic registration because there is a ton of slop on government lists. You, you know, you might think, well, the government knows everything. The government knows who you are. That gosh, they can keep track of your taxes, right? Wrong. They, they, they there's so much, there's so much duplication uh, on government lists. Whether it's the uh, voter registration list, the the driver's license list, the welfare lists, and if you, and, and the idea that these are all accurate, and we're not going to have people then being registered three, four, five times is just simply wrong. And so it, it, it presumes that our government ha has really done a great job of keeping track of who's here, who's not here, um, who's deceased, who's not deceased, uh, who goes by the name Bill, who goes by the name William. Um, and so we, we find that, it, it, let me give you an example. In, um, this isn't even a case of, uh, of automatic registration, but Colorado recently moved to all mail voting, meaning uh, everybody gets a ballot by mail. And what they found was people started seeing all the slop in the list because uh, one state legislator, uh, she got two ballots. Uh, one, I think, in her maiden name, one in her, um, in her uh, married name. Uh, other individuals got multiple ballots because they were registered under one version of their name versus another version of their name. And that's not even in an automatic registration state. That's a state that has more accurate uh, voter rolls. So that's why, a long answer to your short question, that's why I'm opposed to these automatic registration. Sounds great, sounds like it should just happen perfectly, but it ends up creating even more slop in the list. And by slop, I mean inaccurate names, inaccurate data in what should be the most accurate and pristine list you have and up to date, and that is your voter rolls, because you want to make sure that everybody uh, who's registered to vote is able to vote and that nobody who is ineligible to vote is able to vote. Thank you. Hobart. Yes, uh, Hobart Jackson. I'm a Lawrence resident. Uh, coming back to that case in Sedgwick County with the mathematician who wanted to study what she perceived as anomalies in the voting records. Um, it seems very politically expedient that Kansas has a law that seals the votes within a certain amount of time. And I just wondered if you have any comment or theory as to why that would be true. 
Uh, I don't, I, I offered it one theory, other, and I, I can't have any, say anything else other than that. The, the law was passed long before I became Secretary of State, so I wasn't, you know, privy to the legislative debates or in the committees when they discussed it. I think the primary motivation was, you know, sanctity of the, uh, the anonymous ballot, of the, the privacy of the ballot. And that's a really important, uh, you know, principle that we have to maintain as well. And so I think that's why they said, okay, once the contest period, you know, if you, if you want to have a recount, absolutely. These ballots are going to be counted in public. You have, have a contest. A recount is when you, a candidate, bring a challenge to the result and the county canvassers count the ballots and see if you are correct in your belief that you actually won the race or whatever. Uh, a contest is after the recount. A contest is where you go before a judge and you ask the judge to grant relief and to address the question of whether the election was conducted legally, whether the voters voted, were eligible voters. But at, the legislature then said after the contest period, all the inquiries end, the ballots are sealed and put away. I, you know, I, as I said before, I have nothing against uh, audits and I would not oppose any legislation that would you know, model, be modeled after something other states do where you systematically go ahead and do post-election audits to just verify that the machines are counting them properly, that there is, has been uh, no monkey business. I have nothing against it whatsoever. But that's the only uh, explanation I can give for what the legislature did before my time. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I want to, first of all, thank you. Uh, you're someone who obviously really believes voting matters, and I think that's something that a lot of us share, and it's a lot of what brings us here. Um, I want to ask you a question that's sort of part philosophy and part um, policy. Um, and I understand under the state and federal constitutions there are requirements for citizenship, for voting for state and federal and some county offices. But I wonder if more on a philosophical level you could talk about why you think citizenship is an important marker or important hurdle for suffrage. Um, that's, that's an obviously a, a big issue. Um, on a policy level, I'll throw you some policy for the fun of it, um, what would, how would you support um, and would it be possible constitutionally in Kansas for municipalities or counties to allow non-citizens to vote in local elections? Say school board or dog catcher or anything else that a county resident who's not a citizen would be, um, ha would have an interest in. I'm just wondering, I'd just like to give you an opportunity to talk about why citizenship matters to suffrage beyond constitutional and legal issues. issues. That's a great question. Uh, so the, the premise or the principle that you need to be a citizen of the country in order to vote in that country is one that is universally held across the, the planet. I don't think there's any country in the world, there may be one I'm not aware of, that allows non-citizens to vote. Now, non-citizens have all sorts of rights uh, to things like health care in Great Britain. When I was a student at Oxford, I could get free medical care. Into the, but the, the vote is something that is guarded very closely and so it, in, in virtually every, in every country that I know of, uh, there's a, there is a rule that only citizens can vote. And, you know, citizenship is a privilege. It's a privilege to become an American citizen. It's a privilege to become a British citizen, to become a citizen of any country. And it is the, voting is the, uh, I would say, the highest, most important right and duty we have as citizens. And so I think it's appropriate to reserve that to people who have become full citizens. That's how you become a fully participating and express your full participation in the political community. Um, the other reason why philosophically, well this is actually more of a practical reason, I would oppose giving voting rights to non-citizens is they still have voting rights in the country of their citizenship. So now you're allowing the person to uh, participate in the direction of two political communities, both the U.S. political community and their political community back home. And so I think that practical reality is why the globe is configured the way it is, where we, we have to be a member of one political community or another. If you are a member of that political community, then you vote in that political community. And that's just, here's another thing that, to, to take that political, that philosophical principle, I think dual citizenship is problematic uh, for that reason. Um, it used to be that dual citizenship was frowned upon by U.S. law and uh, that you had to renounce all allegiance to any other principality in another place. Uh, and now you don't have, it, the, it happens. A lot of people, that still, they become U.S. citizens, they still retain their citizenship in their other country. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's problematic for the same philosophical reason. You should, you should be um, a participating member and directing only one, commu one community, and that should be the one of your, your citizenship, your true allegiance. Just a policy issue. Could a town or county in oh, sorry, Kansas yeah. allow allow that? Um, 
not under current Kansas law. Kansas, uh, the Kansas Constitution requires that you be a U.S. citizen uh, to have the franchise. I'm trying to think of, trying to think as a lawyer here, is there any well, way... Something like a property tax levy would be something that would affect you whether you're not a citizen. Yeah, no, there, there's no question that, that, heck, all state laws affect yeah. you if, whether you're not a citizen or virtually all state laws affect you if you're a non-citizen living in Kansas. Um, I think it'd be pretty tough to get around our constitutional provision for a city or a county to grant the franchise to non-citizens. Um, I think that's good, but I, you know, if a person disagrees, I can see why as a policy matter they might think they might disagree. I, I think that constitutional provision would be a pretty big barrier sure. to doing it. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Over here, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you said that there was uh, 237 cases over 15 years, and I kind of wonder, is that, uh, that seems pretty petty and not that many to me, is that enough to constitute how much of your concern in your office you put into those cases? And then, um, especially considering, I mean, you had just said that the problem is that judges don't know how to handle these cases because they never really see them. Uh, you said that about 30 minutes ago. Um, and then more specifically, I wonder why is it becoming more and more difficult to vote uh, if we're fundamentally a democracy? And why are you making it more difficult to vote? I mean, you have to get registered, which is the first step. Then you have to pr uh, submit proof of citizenship. Then if you are someone who's taken your spouse's uh, last name, you have to then submit an affidavit explaining why your birth certificate and your photo ID will be different. This has been considered sexist by many people because it mostly targets uh, married women. And... Um, if you don't have a photo ID, you can apply for forms to get a photo ID. Uh, but all of this is caught up in so much bureaucracy, it's starting to get to the point where it seems like you need a degree in public administration just to register to vote in the state. I wonder why. Uh, why can't you focus your energy on making voting easier as it's a fundamental part of our democracy? Thank you. Okay, a couple things. Uh, correction, I did not say judges never see these cases. I said uh, county prosecutors, county attorneys uh, have never brought these cases. And so it's, they have to learn a whole new area of the law. It's, it's burdensome. They've got cases that in their minds are much more important. Uh, 237 cases. Those are 237 cases of voter fraud that were discovered. Voter fraud is a crime, I'm trying to think of an analogy, like trespassing. Uh, it happens all the time, but it is often not caught. So the 237 is the tip of the iceberg. But let's imagine it was only two. That, the, the, this is the, the, the people who oppose photo ID laws are constantly saying, well, how many, you know, that's not enough. I want more cases. Show me a bigger percentage of cases that we know about. Well, look, I would say even if you only had two cases, that would be enough. That would be like saying, look, we've only had, we've had no thefts in my neighborhood for the past 10 years. I'm not going to lock my doors anymore. I'm not worried about it. I mean, the, there's still a very real probability or possibility. But 237 is a big number. And the other argument that I hear is, well, okay, you got your 237, Kobach, but look, over those same years, uh, you know, 4 million Kansans cast ballots, or 3 million, I can't remember what the number is, but um, so that, that 237 is a tiny fraction of this very big number of ballots cast. That argument's a red herring. The question is, are there enough illegal votes cast to sway a, any particular election? And the answer is yes, all the time. We have, uh, we presented to the federal district court in that case I was mentioning, um, the number of cases in which the margin of victory was 50 votes or less. In a 10 year period, I believe we had 24 cases just looking at Congress and the state legislature, not even looking at counties and cities where you really have the close races and, and, and school districts. Um, it happens all the time. So if you have a, a race like the one in KCK, the spring, where it comes down to one vote, if you've got two or 10 or 20 uh, votes by people who aren't qualified to vote in that, in that election, that could swing the race. We just had, a, and just across the state line, there was a, it, it was, even the Kansas City Star acknowledged voter fraud stole a state representative race. It was the Rizzo versus Royster primary in North Kansas City on the Democrat Party side. Um, a large number of people voted uh, fraudulently. There were some non-citizens who voted. Uh, the, the people who were advocating on behalf of Rizzo, who won the race, uh, were bringing the non-citizens to the polls, according to the sworn affidavits of the poll judges. And uh, some of his relatives who didn't live in the district uh, voted as well. And uh, he won by one vote. But there were enough fraudulent votes when it's that close that 
the fraudulent vote steal it. So the question is not, you know, if you looked at the Rizzo versus Royster race, you might have had, let's say, 50 fraudulent votes, but out of the total number of votes cast in Missouri in the primary of 2010, I don't know what the number is, but let's say it's between one and two million. Well, 50 out of one and two million looks tiny, doesn't it? But if you put it in one race where the, the, the outcome is close, that small number of fraudulent votes stole the election. So I just disagree with the notion that you can, you can pick a number and arbitrarily tell me that that number is too small. I think that's fair, but then why don't you have the passion and endorsement for the statistician out of Wichita's efforts to understand this? Because if you're so concerned about voter fraud, shouldn't you be speaking out against the law that bans you from opening the votes? And also, 237 is a very small number compared to the hundreds of thousands of people in Kansas who could be voting but do not vote because of this stuff. I mean, I try to register people to vote, and I can't tell you how many people, the minute you say you have to submit proof of citizenship, they just laugh, and they're like, sorry, I'm not going to do that, because well, it's such a pain. It, you know, I think that it's, we have made it exceedingly easy to do this. I mean, you can do it from your cell phone. You can do it from your couch at home. You don't have to go to the office and present anything. We really have been over backward to try to make it as, as unobtrusive, unburdensome as possible to provide that information. By the way, uh, if you're born in Kansas, I, I didn't even mention this, we, so we get the number of people who are new registrants, they've, start, they've filled out the card, they've registered to vote, they haven't provided proof of citizenship yet. If you do it when you're getting your driver's license, you already have to as a new driver's license applicant in Kansas, I'm sure most of the younger people know it wasn't true when I got my driver's license. You now have to prove your citizenship or if you're not a citizen, you have to provide certain documentation. So DMV's already got your certificate, it'll be automatically sent over to the secretary or to the county election office in, in our statewide voter database. So you're, it'll automatically happen that way if you've got a Kansas driver's license uh, it will, and you're young. It will automatically happen if you've got your birth certificate. You're born in Kansas, we, every month our office sends to the Kansas Department of Vital Statistics a list of all of our people who haven't yet proven citizenship. We prove it for you if you've got a Kansas birth certificate on file and so we can help you that way. So we're really doing a lot to help people do this. I just, I guess we just have a difference of opinion on how difficult it is to, you know, if you're not in those categories where we'll do it for you, uh, to fish out your birth certificate and just take a picture with your phone and send it in. Chris, could I, could I, I want to follow up, I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative and follow up by framing that question sort of a little bit differently. Um, we've, we've, you've mentioned some numbers, 237, 20. Uh, your perception is that those numbers are large and they're the tip of the iceberg. Others perceive those numbers as small and not indicating a severe enough problem to justify the legislative effort represented by the Kansas law. But leaving that aside, leaving aside whether those are big numbers or small numbers, uh, is there a level of evidence that would be convincing to you, a level of evidence about the practical ballot access denying impact of these laws? that could convince you that what you've done on the integrity of the process side is outweighed by the negative practical effect on the access side? Sure, if there were, yeah, if there was uh, hard evidence that people who are eligible to vote were not able to vote, uh, and, and you know, it, it wouldn't take that high a number to persuade me. But the, the, but get this, that we've been sued uh, by, by the ACLU, which of course has been opposed to photo ID laws and proof of citizenship laws for years. Um, so, and I, in, in litigation on immigration or on, on this issue, I I've go, up, I'll go up against the ACLU attorneys all the time. I know many of them by first name in, in various states. Um, they have done their best to find the, they, they need plaintiffs. They need plaintiffs who have faced real barriers to being able to vote. And so, I have looked with great interest at the plaintiffs that they've been able to find. And in this one case that is still pending in Kansas court right now, uh, they tried to find people who had true barriers to being able to register to vote in Kansas. Uh, it's a case of Blanke and Jones versus Kobach, and the plaintiffs are Mr. Blanke and Mr. Jones. And uh, the barrier they found, so this is the ACLU finding the best plaintiff they can find. The barrier they found is that both Mr. Blanke and Mr. Jones both possess their passport and a birth certificate, passport holders no less, you know, a lot of people don't have a passport, and they, um, the, the barrier that they presented in their complaint to the court was that uh, this plaintiff said that he, he had just moved to Kansas from Seattle, um, and he felt that it would be too much effort to search through his boxes moving for, that he had just used moving to find his birth certificate, and that that was too much effort to force him to go through. But get this, and I, I think that's laughable, but get this, he did fish through 
his passport. He needed the Kansas driver's license. And both of these plaintiffs were quite happy to go through those boxes and get their passports, which they presented, to get the driver's license at about the same time they were registering to vote. So evidently, they had no trouble when it comes to getting a driver's license. But, oh, to vote, no, I just can't go in that box again. It's just too much. So I have yet to see a case of a, an eligible Kansas person who can vote uh, actually being denied uh, the ability to, to register in Kansas. And, and the ACLU is doing their darndest to find the best plaintiffs they can. So until they present a better one, I'm not convinced. Thank you. Thanks for your question. You didn't answer the young man's question about why you don't pursue electoral, the statistical analysis of electoral fraud as vigorously as you chase these. Next question over here. Will you answer that question? No, the next question is coming from here. Thank you. I, I, I will, you, you'll, you just watch the next legislative session. You may be surprised. <laughs> Secretary Kovach, I think that um, I'm happy to hear that I think we very much agree that the right to vote is our most basic ticket in this democracy and that it, it is what gives me, it is what gives you the right to have rights, the right to influence what happens to us. And so kind of a follow-up question, what is the justification um, where is the justice in, or maybe in your opinion, the injustice in um, counting our prisoners and districting when they do not have the right to vote while under state supervision, as you said earlier. Um, but we do count them in districting, and it does matter where those prisons are located. And so what is the justice or the injustice or the justification for um, counting our prisoners in districting when they do not have the right to vote? I, I, if I'm following your question, I think the, uh, the same logic would apply that I mean, I think a very good argument could be made that during the period that they shouldn't be counted during the period of the, the state's supervision where they're not, they don't actually, they're not an eligible voter during that period. I really think that the principle behind this case that uh, Professor McAllister was mentioning is an important one, and that is if you count warm bodies in a jurisdiction and not eligible voters, you will have vastly different voter power in one jurisdiction versus another because one has twice as many eligible voters and yet they both only get one representative. So, you know, I think if the United States moves to, right now we apportion based on warm bodies. But I think if we do move toward a system, and this Supreme Court case may force that or may not, uh, if we do move toward a system where you count eligible voters, then I think the answer is yes, you should treat uh, felons who, are un who currently are disenfranchised, you would treat the same way as a non-citizen. And those non-citizens may eventually gain the franchise, just like the felon may eventually gain his franchise back. John? Okay, uh, I want to revisit this question of uh, who gets affected by these uh, measures, these requirements, um, and introduce the term disproportionality. Um, you may say that the requirements apply to everybody, but some people are better prepared to uh, meet the requirements than others. and. Uh, Historically, in the United States, over the last 100 years, voter participation has, has gone down. And uh, particularly among people um, who don't have as much money, don't have income, who, who maybe work two or three jobs, who are you know, struggling you know, to get through the week, um, who don't have the time, uh, or, or you know, put it off and, and they don't get around to it. And uh, there's a good deal of uh, evidence that, that these kind of requirements uh, are disproportional in their impact on, on voter participation. Uh, and it probably, I would, it's a safe bet that it far outweighs 237 cases over 15 years. Uh, so, I mean, so if you kind of weigh the results or the impact of this thing, it, it really um, doesn't make sense in terms of, of really... Um, extending the franchise to as many people as possible who, who qualify. Um, okay, a couple of reactions. One is, uh, yeah, voter participation uh, has been dropping in America uh, over many, many decades. Um, it's also been dropping as a, when I did my political science doctorate, I actually was looking at voting in, in some European countries as a subject of my dissertation. It's been dropping in every mature democracy in the world. I mean, it's not just in America where voter participation is dropping. You see voter participation at a very high level in some nascent democracies that just, you know, were formed out of the former Soviet bloc, but then it just tends to drop off with time. It is, it is not a unique 
problem to the United States of not enough people engaging in the, in the political process. And I think it is a tragedy, but it is a tragedy worldwide that for some reason in these uh, wealthy societies with a relatively long history of democratic representation in the political process that uh, voter participation is tailing off. Now you mentioned disproportionality and you say there is evidence of disproportionality. I assume you're suggesting racial disproportionality uh, in, in the effect. Wealth, income. Income disproportionality, okay. There, there have been arguments of, of both. Um, the evidence, when you say it, there will, be, there will be someone who will try to do a study and they will try to assess this. But in most states, including Kansas, neither your race nor your income is on the voter rolls. Obviously your income's not gonna be there, but your, your race is not recorded on the voter rolls. So uh, you can, I can look at, we, we can see the, the voter history of every person in this room. It's a matter of public record. Uh, when someone goes door to door in your neighborhood and they're knocking on doors trying to get your vote, they will see before they walk up to your door, oh, I see uh, Mr. Smith voted in the last two general elections but didn't vote in the primary. So that's public record. But you won't know unless you actually go to that person's door, what his or her race is and what his or her income is. I suppose you guess at the income. So these studies that attempt to address that, they do some pretty dicey things. They attempt to assess race by looking at people's names. They attempt to assess and, and trying to guess from a surname. Now, you, if you are a woman or in, 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 if you are whatever, if you are the person who changes one's name uh, going into a marriage, uh, then the surname you acquire has absolutely no correlation uh, with your race necessarily. And so this, I think these studies do some pretty dicey things to try to get a very rough impression of the races and the incomes. On income, they look at neighborhood and they say, okay, well, exactly. most of look the homes- Look at the district level, sure. Most of the, homes, most of the homes in this neighborhood are you know, of this value, so therefore I'm gonna make assume, assumptions about a person's uh, wealth there too. Again, that's pretty, that's pretty rough analysis too. I mean, you know, look at Lawrence, for example. You have people who live in some of our historic neighborhoods in Lawrence who have you know, money to build a giant house in the suburbs, but they don't wish to because they wish to live here. So again, it, you know, yeah, they tried it to show that there might be some correlation there, but it, the, the evidence is very sketchy. Um, I thought you were going with the, the race evidence because that's where, you know, that the really interest, you know, the, fo the controversy is, I think. And, uh, you know, if you look at the state that had photo ID in place for the longest, and that was Georgia and Alabama, the two, Georgia did a lot of tracking with exit polls and they found that voter participation among African American voters went up after their photo ID law and insignificantly after it went into effect. And there are lots of theories about that and I don't know if the theories are valid or not. One theory I've heard is that in some of the rural districts where fraud had been very prevalent for many years and people believed that the elections were rigged, once they got the photo ID law in place, they had a higher degree of confidence that the elections were not rigged and, they, and people started voting more. I don't know, but they, it's, it's, to say that the evidence points one way or another is, is really problematic. And as someone who likes looking at this data and likes getting into it, it's just not there. Yeah, I, I think most social scientists would disagree with that assessment. Thanks, John. Over here. Hi. Uh, um, if, when a case of uh, double voting is found, how do you make sure that the, it, when the person is found to be double voting accidentally, how do you figure out which vote to cast in the ballot? Well, it, there really aren't going to be cases of double voting accidentally. I mean, you could have a case where someone was senile, maybe, or, you know, somehow lost you know, awareness of the previous ballot and maybe voted... Now, you're not going to have that happen in Kansas because if a person votes an absentee ballot, like I said, you're not going to be able to vote in person. You'll be given a, a provisional ballot on election day if the person walks up to the polls. But let's suppose um, a person votes in two states, uh, is very advanced in age, and doesn't realize that he or she's cast a ballot in the other state. In that instance, it would not be willful. And so you would not, the, the, the person could not be prosecuted uh, under, under those circumstances. So accidental double voting of the prosecutable type, you know, doesn't really happen because there has to be willfulness to prosecute the double vote. But you would be amazed uh, how many cases of serial double voters we have seen over the years where people get away with it and they just do it every year because no one's stopping them. Thank you. Sure. And I think we'll go over here and then we will, I think we're a little bit after seven o'clock now, we'll, we'll 
take the four standing uh, to ask questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yes, sir. Sure. I want to ignore disparate impact for a moment and look at pure convenience. And just on a policy level, let's say your um, policies in terms of the additional requirements for voting result in a net decrease of 10,000 votes in terms of turnout. And yes, that's purely convenient. Let's just say for a moment they all could have gone through the steps, but these additional steps cost 10,000 less voters. Where does that play into your analysis in terms of the policies you propose? Well, that's a, and that's one of the issues that uh, people have been looking at in, in terms of the photo ID states. So now you have about a dozen photo ID states, and so you've got a lot of data points, and people have started to look, okay, well, can we make an assessment based on turnout uh, in these photo ID states? And the GAO, Government Accountability Do Office, did this recently. Um, and they suggested that there was a, they, they thought that there was a slight decrease in turnout, but they in my opinion, they were comparing apples to oranges because what they did is they said, okay, well, we're going to take um, Kansas, one of the, they looked at Kansas and Tennessee as the two states that adopted photo ID, and then they looked at a whole, the rest of the country. They just tried to pick different states, and they compared Kansas to Maine. And they said in the 2012 election, you know, Kansas uh, didn't have that many people vote, or at least they're compared, the, the change from 2008 to 2012 in Kansas was lesser in a positive direction than the change from 2008 to 2012 in Maine. And, and so they were taking two states, two presidential elections, and looking at the change in that four-year cycle. But the problem was that Maine ha is, a, is a popular initiative state. They had some statewide initiatives on the ballot. They had a very competitive Senate race on the ballot. Kansas in 2012 uh, did not. Um, every 12 years, because of the way Kansas cycles where we have our statewide officers not on the presidential cycle, every 12 years you will have a presidential election in Kansas where there is no statewide officer on the ballot, no, no senator, because those are the only possible statewide officers. That happened in Kansas in 2012. And the, pre next, the previous time it happened in Kansas was 2000. So my argument was, okay, if you want to assess the effect of photo ID, which went into effect in, 2000, in January 1st, 2012, you would look at 2,000 and compare apples to apples. You have roughly the same electorate, the people of Kansas of 2,000, people of Kansas of 2012. You have no statewide, and the reason you need statewide campaigns is statewide campaigns are the only ones that have the money to do get out the vote. If any of you have worked in campaigns, you know this. Get out the vote efforts cost a lot of money, and only statewide campaigns are going to have that kind of dollars to bring to bear. And so, if, so when there's no statewide get out the vote effort, then you're, then you're comparing ac apples to apples. As it turns out, the percentage of voters who voted in 2012 was 66.7%. The percentage of voters who voted in 2000, or no, I'm sorry, 67.6, anyway, about 67%. The percentage of voters in 2000 was one-tenth of a percent lower than that. It was almost exactly identical, which suggests that probably the proof of citizenship provision didn't affect turnout in a substantial way. The other thing is that you can, our laws, it, it allows you to correct your, you know, uh, forgetting, right? So say you, you show up at the polls, almost everybody drives to the polls, but you just didn't have your driver's license with you when you drove, and you, you go ahead and you cast a provisional ballot under our law. You then have, depending on the county, either six or nine days until the county canvass, and you can uh, provide your proof of citizenship after the fact. And so a lot of people do that and take advantage of the opportunity to provide their proof of citizen, sorry, provide their photo ID after the fact, um, after voting in the election. And uh, we've looked at those numbers too. For example, in 2012, uh, we, out of the 1.2 million votes cast, there were 838 provisional ballots for lack of sufficient photo ID when the vote was cast. That's 0.07% of the votes, or seven one hundredths of 1%, fewer than one in 1,000. After that, the election day, they had the opportunity to bring in their photo ID to make their vote count. Now, bear in mind, a lot of people are going to say, I already know what the result was, and the lady I was going to vote for for state rep, she lost by 2,000 votes, so I'm not going to bother. But still, after that, 306 people did present their photo ID after the fact, um, and we looked, that was 2012, so we were looking very carefully at the numbers and trying to see if there was any real barriers to people voting. The evidence just isn't there. I mean, it, it shows that the percentage of turnout is very close. So let's go to the, we, yeah. we, we have, we have three, and these people have been very patient. You've been generous with your time, but, but I think we're running uh, toward what we projected as the end of time. So Sean, why don't you so, go ahead? Uh, again, thank you 
Mr. Secretary, for coming, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for agreeing to participate in this. It's been a, a very interesting discussion. I, would, I was going to push back also on the, the disproportionality, but I think John did a good enough job on that. So I want to I applaud you, I think, on the, the way that you've tried to um, make it easier to show proof of citizenship, et cetera, in these online apps, these faxings, all of that. But the problem is not only that, it's also getting a photo ID. And whether or not you agree with the Justice Department's pushback on that um, and the, the access to that, it can inhibit some people to get an ID. It's very easy for us to say, many of the people that are sitting here and able to come here, that we have IDs. But there are places in Kansas where people do not have IDs, and it doesn't matter on race. They may live in Maple Hill, which I didn't know much about until a few years ago when I went there. There's nothing for 20, 30 miles either way, right? And if you don't have a car, and you don't have the money to get there, how are you going to get a photo ID? Would you support enacting similar things that you're doing for proof of citizenship to make a mobile registration car, go to these communities, to actually make it easier, if the real idea is to make sure everyone has the right to vote and proper identification, what would you do and what would your office do to make it easier in this access? Because that's the hang-up. We, we actually have uh, done that both from our office and uh, at the county level, because the county clerks and election office, election commissioners do a lot of this themselves, and we've tried to back them up and help them. So for example, one option, is, or one community that could possibly need help is uh, people in nursing homes. Um, and so we've made efforts to contact nursing homes and ask them to make sure that everybody in the nursing home uh, has a photo ID. Now there is a permanent advanced voter law in, Amer in Kansas, which is that if you are physically um, unable to make it to the polls, you can get on our permanent advance ballot list statewide, and then you will have an advance ballot sent to you automatically without having to show photo ID on election day for that. So people who are, who are physically disabled can get on that list. But what about economic hardship to get some So even from Baltimore, they may be not be able to drive here to get their photo ID. And it's difficult for right. us to sit here at a place of institution and understand it, but people struggle every day. And it's difficult for someone to find a ride, even to come 15 miles. We, and like I say, we, we've made available the free uh, non-driver ID to people, but you'd say, well, okay, the person still has to get to a government office to, uh, to get that ID. Um, at some point, the person does actually have to physically go somewhere to get it. Uh, and that was actually one of the issues that uh, Justice Stevens looked at um, in passing in the uh, uh, Marion County case. And he said that, the, you know, that... that minimal burden of having to get an ID if you don't have one is not sufficient to say that the constitutional right to vote is, 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 is infringed upon in a way that would you know, make, render the law invalid. So you know, I acknowledge that if a person doesn't have any photo ID and they have a very long way to go to a government office, that might, be, that might put them in a slightly different position than a student at KU who uh, has the student ID, which qualifies him or her, by the way. And our, and our list of photo IDs is very large and generous, unlike some states, uh, Texas has a slightly small, narrower list. And so, you know, we've really tried to make this as easy as possible to do. We accept um, IDs from cities, too, and, and from other jurisdictions, uh, governmental jurisdictions. So I, the answer to your question is yes, we do support the counties. Uh, the counties are the key points of contact because they know where an individual might exist or not exist who doesn't have a photo ID. But um, the, the numbers are really, really small in terms of the people who actually don't have one. It's really hard to function in the 21st century without a photo ID. You cannot cash checks. You cannot, uh, for all practical purposes, have a bank account if you don't have a photo ID. You can't go into any government building. You can't you know, fly. You can't, and a, a person who's an indigent wouldn't be flying, presumably. But it's pretty hard to function. Um, I'll, I know I'm giving a long answer to a short question, but let me just give you this one uh, anecdote. So I have this radio show, this talk show on KCMO in, in Kansas City. Um, when this law was being deliberated, one night I decided I was going to, for the bulk of the show, for over an hour, say if there's anyone who's here in the range of my voice and doesn't have a photo ID, please call in. I want to hear. What, what, what are your circumstances? Did this constantly throughout the show. And, and it's, a, you know, it's a weekend show, but the, you know, you're talking at any given time to somewhere between two and 4,000 people. And, and the, the people come in and go out of that audience. And eventually, a guy calls, and he says, uh, yeah, I don't have a photo ID. And 
he, and I said, okay, so where do you live? What's, what's your story? He says he lives in downtown Kansas City, in downtown, downtown, in the business district. And uh, he said that he purposefully did not have an ID because he wants to live off the grid. He, and I said, well, how do you, you know, how do you, where do you work? How do you get to work? And he says, I work at a restaurant. I ride my bike to the restaurant. Okay, how do you get paid? Oh, I have an arrangement. I get paid in cash. Um, and, you know, he, he was really making efforts not to be on the grid. And, uh, and so that's, that's really interesting. It was clear that he was making substantial effort to exist without a photo ID and to have a job without a photo ID. And, uh, but at the end of the discussion, I said, well, you know, you live in Missouri, but if you lived in Kansas, would you have a problem then with our law? And he said, no, if I wanted to vote, I'd get one. But, you know, he, but he obviously didn't want to vote because he wanted to be totally disconnected from, you know, civil society. So my point is, yes, we can hypothesize that there might be someone who's so far and from any place where they could get that free ID that it might be possible, but as a practical matter, it is really tough to exist in society without a photo ID, and for that very tiny sliver of people who don't have one, I'm glad we're giving them a free one now because it gives them access to a lot of things they didn't have before. Next question, penultimate question. Uh, thank you. I know you've said that uh, all new people on the suspense list go through a monthly vital statistics check to see if they're born in Kansas. Yeah. I wondered if your office has found the computer glitch or whatever it is that has caused Kansas-born citizens on the suspense list to be there a number of months and they weren't found until the complete 36,000 list was sent through vital statistics at the end of September before your 90-day rule came into effect? I'm not aware of any computer glitch that caused the numbers. Not I have quite a number of names uh, in Douglas County that were Kansas-born citizens, and they'd been on the suspense list for several months, I would, and they were only found with this last check. I'd love, well, so, so they were found, they, okay. With this check of the complete list. Um, so I was wondering what the glitch might be to can you, miss them. I, I don't know of any glitch. I mean, it, what happens is we, they're separate agencies, and one of the problems with government agencies is they, they have their silos, right? So they have, Vital Statistics is very protective of the uh, birth certificate records, and Kansas law doesn't allow my office to come in and, and do the inspection of birth certificates. So we have to send to Vital Statistics a list of all the people whose registrations are incomplete, and they have to do the checking for us. So if there is a glitch, um, I guess it would be on their end, but I'd like to know about it. So if you, if you have a list of people who you believe we're on the incomplete list for a long I, time? I, know, I do have I, a list. I'd, I'd be, if you could give me those names, if you feel comfortable, I can then say to Vital Statistics, okay, why weren't these, were these names run earlier and why weren't they caught earlier? I'd be happy to do that uh, for you if, if you want me to. Should I send that to Brian Kasky? Yes, actually that would be great. Brian Kasky is our Director of Elections. Okay. Absolutely. Sir. Hi, um, <clears throat> my name is Alex Smith. I'm a sociologist from Warwick University in Britain. I actually wanted to return to the really interesting question about extending the, extending the franchise to um, non-US citizens. I just wanted to start by correcting you on a few points. You made the statement that it's universally accepted that in order to vote in elections in any country, you have to be a citizen of that country. As far as I knew, yeah. That, that isn't actually true of Britain. It isn't actually true of many EU states. Um, I'm originally Australian. I am a dual national of Britain uh, now, but before I became a naturalized citizen of Britain as well as an Australian citizen, I was able to vote in all elections as a Commonwealth citizen. The rule in the UK is that uh, if you have indefinite leave to remain or you're a permanent resident, in other words. Yeah, but Commonwealth is a special case, though. I mean, well, I, it's a special case, but yeah. it ain't a citizen. And that's yeah. the point. And again, right, with EU Americans states. Americans weren't allowed to vote in England when I was there, and they still aren't allowed to vote. Yeah, in, England, so. in EU states, you're allowed to vote in different kinds of elections. So, in, in fact, municipal elections in many countries you can. You can certainly vote in European elections wherever you are. Sure, and but that's, in, in European elections are multinational. No, no, I, 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 under, I understand that. But again, this principle, this principle of voting in elections does not depend in these countries on being a citizen of that country. Again, in Scotland, which is actually where I live, a, a Commonwealth citizen, an Irish Irish citizen, an EU citizen can vote in any, uh, sorry, not an EU citizen, those first three categories can vote in any elections. That's local government, Scottish Parliament, general elections, which is for Westminster. Can you give me an example yeah. of a country that is not part of the British Commonwealth and is not part of the EU where that country allows non-citizens? Because EU, you're talking about e yeah. EU elections. I, I, don't, I don't want, well, I'm actually talking about all elections for Commonwealth citizens. You know, all Commonwealth citizens in the UK, if they want to register to vote, 
can vote in all elections in the UK. Now, I know there's a particular history behind why that is the case, but it does, it, it does actually refute the point, the assertion you made, which is you have to be a citizen to vote. And that's, that's the point I wanted to make. The second point is a, is a very specific practical example. So for example, me and my brother, we both migrated from Australia 15 years ago. We both now live in the UK. I have dual citizenship, my brother doesn't. He's in effect a permanent resident. So he's participating in the community of Britain. He's paying his taxes. He votes. He votes. He's not a citizen, but he votes in everything. Um, <clears throat> I think you can make an argument in this country, given that it was found. It was founded. Well, the revolution began with the, with one of the slogans being, you know, no representation, no taxation without representation. If you have legally domiciled non-U.S. citizens paying their taxes, going about their business, obeying the laws, being supportive and productive citizens of this country. Is there not an injustice in denying them the right to vote in a political community, however you define that, whether nationally, state level, municipal, wherever? I think other countries have found ways of sort of managing that, and I accept there's a philosophical view that, uh, you know, that shouldn't be the case, but given that other countries are prepared to deal with the mess of social life in, in ways which may not look so clean, I don't see necessarily why the US couldn't play with certain kinds of ideas. And by, by all means, feel free to respond. Yeah. Well, I, I, that's why I, I pressed you on whether outside the... I mean, the Commonwealth is a special case because you are both a citizen of the Commonwealth... But and it is a 54 your, countries, so, you know, it's a lot it, of countries. <laughs> yeah. What's that? 54 countries in the right, Commonwealth. Yeah, it's a lot of countries, you know, the, right? The, the Brits got around, didn't they? Right. I mean, the, the, yeah, I, but, the, but that's the, the policy of the Commonwealth is that they have this sort of umbrella citizenship in addition to your national... Citizenship well, I think we call it subjecthood, actually, subjecthood, rather than citizenship. Yeah, we, but, we, we but, but nonetheless, I'm just trying to rebut case. the point that you made about the universally accepted principle. It isn't universally accepted. And I think, no, I, given that, there's a lot more interesting things that could be explored. I, I think there is a, a, a Thanks very, for the question. There's a Thank very you. interesting argument. Uh, it, many would find it to be a compelling argument. I don't. That it, because you are present in a place and you are paying sales taxes in that place while you're living there, uh, that you are enough of a informal citizen that you ought to be able to vote. Um, I, I just disagree with that. I think that you, you know, countries have their many different thresholds of what, in some countries it is virtually impossible to become a citizen. Try to become a citizen of Switzerland, you know, good luck. Um, in other countries it's relatively easy to become a citizen. The waiting period maybe is, uh, in some Europe, EU countries, I think it's down to like three years. Uh, so the countries establish their own standard for membership in the political community, but it is their right to establish their own standard and their own criteria for becoming a member of that political community. And I, I think that there's something that is uh, just about that, that you, you will have your full right to vote once you're a member of the political community. We will have guests in our political community. But you know, you may be in the United States for, and I don't know your exact you know, personal uh, situation, but you might be here for 10 years, or you might be here for two years. And the, you know, the question of, you know, whether you're, if you're not going to be permanently here and become sort of fully vested in the political community, I think the American political community has the right to say, okay, no, you, you know, we, we welcome you here, but, um, you know, you won't get to vote till you're an American citizen. So I, I understand that there are, there are compelling arguments on the other side, but I think the arguments in favor of reserving the vote to U.S. citizens are more compelling. And that's why, you know, I think you, that's why you see the high poll numbers too, I mean, on, on that particular question. Um, you, you'll find relatively few Americans who want to extend suffrage to non-citizens. Thank you, Steve, for your participation. Chris, thank you for your participation.